Chapter two. Before we got on with chapter two, I wanted to address a lot of the things. There's been a lot of activity on TikTok as far as history and history tellers on TikTok. There's been a lot of conversations, been a lot of discussion, there's been a lot of arguments, the people going back and forth. I've seen all the mentions, comments, everything that everybody has to say, and I appreciate all the participation as far as history is concerned. Everybody that is either angered or you know disgruntled about any of the history that I'm sharing, that's just one piece of the history, is the tattoo thing that everybody was going back and forth as far as on TikTok. A couple things I want you guys to consider, even though the history that you guys know is the history we all knew, it's the history we all shared and we all believed and that's what it was based on, especially the ones that are in disagreement. I just want you to understand that I am sharing a part of history that comes strictly and only from Mariner's point of view as he experienced it. Consider this, before the Pacific was divided, so you have America coming into Hawaii, you have Germany going to Samoa, America in American Samoa, the French in Tahiti, the British in the Cook Islands, Tonga obviously is the British. Once those, those divisions were made, they started to educate the people. We're talking about the 1830s and on. Through the educations of teaching everybody how to speak and write in English, even to conform into some of the societal norms of the Western world, a Western civilization, everybody was being educated by all these different countries, divided and now educated to read and write. And once they became educated enough to read and write, what did they start doing? They started writing their own history, each country, each island. If that didn't happen until they were ready to read and write and became proficient at it, which didn't happen until 1860s to the 1890s, then they started writing history. That's all the history we have. That's what everybody believes. That's what we have always shared as far as belief. I'm inviting everybody to do is to follow me through this journey because I'm gonna cut everything up. I'm gonna basically dissect history from Mariner's perspective, from his point of view, from his experience because he wasn't trying to write history. Once everybody was divided and started writing their own history, they're now recording history that was passed on orally before them. And because that's the case, I have read, I've come across a lot of things in the Mariner's book. And the, the reason why I'm so big on this book is the fact that it was there, he was there, an intimate account of him being in Tonga learning all the cultural and the customs and traditions of Tonga and a lot of the Polynesians before the Western civilization got there, before colonization, before education or any institution was there to influence them to conform to whether it was religion or education. This account is the most in-depth, most intimate account that anybody has ever made about Tonga or Polynesia, period, is Mariner's account. Now you're saying, oh, but it's a white guy. A lot of them, people are saying on the comments, oh, you, why you believe the white man, you believe the colonizer. And to that I say, nobody knew anything until the colonizers came in and instructed everybody how to read and write. And even the proficiency of that didn't show up for another 30 to 40 years. This happened before any of that, before the divide, before anybody was educated in anything else. Everybody until then, until this point, until the Western world showed up, everybody who stopped by in Polynesia basically showed up and took snapshots or selfies of Polynesia, anybody who showed up in Polynesia. Nobody lived there, learned the language, learned the culture before Western civilization. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm sharing. So it's suspicious to me that we were divided and colonized by outside big civilizations and Western civilization or, or countries and then influenced and then we conformed to whatever they brought with them, educated by them, and then after that, they told us, all right, write your history. There are, only, there are very small things that we share as far as beliefs, and most of it has to do with the gods. Throughout the Pacific, we share Tangaloa. Throughout the Pacific, we share Maui. That's mostly where our history is shared. Other than that, it seems like whoever was in power at that point in time, whoever was the leaders of the country, of the islands, in the islands that were part of that island, it seems like they started creating their own version of Polynesian history from that point. That's the history that everybody believes. That's the history we, we all know because the Palangis didn't know any of this. They didn't know 
our culture or traditions or the customs of Polynesia. They had, they, they left it to us to create it, to bring it about. It's not like they gathered all the Polynesian islands and said, all right, right when they got there and said, all right, hey, before we divide them, let's have them get together, get into a council of some sort and have them record their history and we'll write it down. No, it wasn't like that. They came and divided us first, then they educated, and then everybody started writing their histories down. That's why Mariner's story is so important because it was before any of the divide. So I'm just inviting everybody who knows history, everybody who is interested in history or thinks they know to follow me as I dissect this entire, I'm going to give an elaborate, extensive and comprehensive deep dive into this Mariner experience. He wasn't a writer of history. He wasn't even a, a, an author. He was just there and he happened to run into an author of savage islands and savage nations. John Martin is the one that became interested in Mariner's story because he heard he lived amongst the savages and it was him that was interested in knowing his experience. So Mariner went over there and told him, this is my experience. This is what happened. He wasn't trying to create anything. I see a lot of comments telling me, you know, you're dumb, you're stupid. You have have a low IQ, right? Um, you have autism or whatever it is that, that, that all the insults came at uh, from the comment section and going at each other. Get that all out, right? Insult me, whatever it is that you guys want to do, whatever you guys want to think and feel, get it all out. And all I'm asking for is take a look, right? Compare it. Is your skepticism like mine? After I read this book, there was a lot of skeptical things that I've heard and know about Tonga. I'm even skeptical about the history of Tonga after I read this book. That's what I wanted to start with today, okay? Having said that, welcome to class. <laughs> this is brought to you by Kava University. This would be my dissertation for my PhD and I'm sharing it with you guys. I am going to dissect everything I know about this book and about the culture and about the people and how what I'm saying isn't to divide anybody. No, this is pre-Western civilization. Everything I'm sharing is to unify us behind, oh, maybe there was more than just, just Hawaiian, just Samoan, just Tongan, under one empire. So. Let's move along. Chapter two. So remember they're in Tola. There was that young girl that was in the nunnery and she put a curse on the Port au Prince and Mariner himself and said that he wouldn't see his parents. The ship will never see England. They have that celebration and they greet farewell with the governor and the people. They load up. The personality of Port au Prince has already been set for us. We know they're, they're pirates or the, the behavior today would be considered pirate behavior because they took brigs, they took boats and they took sloops and all these different types of boats and ships ships and whatnot, and they attacked them and took their stuff and took prisoners and sold prisoners back to their lands, to their towns. We already know what the personality of the Proto Prince is. We already know what he, what they want to do. Saturday, February 15th, they're in Cocos, off the coast of Costa Rica. The ship is leaking, they work on the leak, they fix it, they repair it, they do the watering and whatever, and then, they, then they're gone. February 15th, they go towards the whaling grounds. Now, Mr. Brown is the whaling master. He's happy. They're finally going to do what he came for. He came to find whales. March 5th, they sail by Pan de Azucar. They sail for another two or three weeks with nothing. They weren't able to find any whales. By now, the men are extremely discontented at this point because they were happy and they liked doing the whole pirating thing. They liked taking stuff and getting rich because they're getting richer. The more they do this, the more they pirate and pillage and plunder. Now they're like, oh, what, the, what are we doing? Whales? March 30th, they capture another Spanish brig, the Santa Isidora on its way to Acapulco with a shipment of cocoa, cocoa beans. They get prisoners from these ships and they put them on their ships as prisoners, but they keep the carpenters to help fix the ship because remember the Port Ar Prince is leaking. A guy named McFarland, a surgeon, he deserted. He finds a way to escape. May 12th, they catch four whales, adding to their entire catch, which put it up to 15. June 3rd, they fly the American flag again. So now it looks like the whaling isn't working out. We're gonna fly the American flag and go back what we're used to, gaining prizes. Now they're at the Maria Islands. So they fall in with this merchant ship and they plan to take it, but they wanted to wait till it was nighttime because the ship was well protected by the town. So basically they played buddy buddy with the ship until it got dark where they can plan to take the ship. June 18th, they run into hard weather that kind of throws that plan off. So now they can't take that ship or any ships for that matter. So they have a little scuffle with the other ship and they are able to acquire 20 prisoners, which they send to the shore on a longboat. Because they were under the American flag, it seemed like they still looked friendly. Mariner says that there were two Negroes and two Hispanic guys, Spanish guys, got onto the Port Prince and then they detained them. They tried to send the two Negroes back to shore 
but the two Negroes begged Captain Duck to stay on board. Now everybody's wondering why. Come to find out, the owner of the two Negroes was wanted back on shore because he wants his Negroes back, which means they're in South America they owned slaves at that point. But Captain Duck wouldn't allow it. For some reason, Captain Duck was, was willing to pillage and plunder and get prizes and get rich. But Mariner said that he didn't want to send somebody into slavery, so he kept the two black guys on board. Plus, they were on their knees clasping at Captain Duck's uh, legs and begging them not to send them to shore. June 23rd, the two Miko guys tell Captain Duck, you know, there's two ships that are expected in Acapulco with two shipments of cocoa and they're, they'll be here in a couple days. Captain Duck obviously thinks it's a good idea. Two more shipments of cocoa? Yeah, we're waiting for these two ships to get to Acapulco. The whaling master, Mr. Brown, he starts arguing with Captain Duck, like, don't we have enough? This should, we're rich enough, or you guys are rich enough. I came for the whaling. We should set our priorities so that we're only doing, we we were supposed to come and do merchant stuff, trade and you know acquire some stuff for gain prizes, but now it's getting out of hand. They get into an argument, each of them had their own agendas, so they don't wait for the two brigs, they go on and sail because the whaling master wants to go catch some more whales. Mariner is under the impression that if they had just gone and done what they had to do without doing all the extracurricular stuff, they would have been cool. They would have went and did the merchants to trade, the getting whales, and they would have been just fine. They would have made enough, they would have been back to England. England. But that wasn't the case. We already know what they are now. August 1st, they're in Cerros. There were boards that were eaten up by the rats. The carpenter had to go fix that and fix the leaks and whatnot. An American ship shows up. They tell everybody in the Port of Prince, Captain Duck and them, that there are a couple ships up on the coast of California with money and with fur and other products. You might want to go lift that off of them. Okay. <laughs> Captain Duck feels, okay, I'm feeling ill right now. I'm kind of sick. So after I feel better, then we'll go. August 11th, Captain Duck dies. And now Mr. Brown becomes a captain. The whaling master is the captain now. So the whaling master is saying, all right, we're going to the Sandwich Islands. We're, that's where we're headed next. And all the men are like, no, we want to go grab you know, the cocoa and the fur and the money and whatever else. That's what they're here to do. That's what we, the captain, had planned to do. But since they're under the new direction, they have to go to Hawaii now back then called the Sandwich Islands. August 13th, Captain Duck is buried. He was considered a worthy man, uh, an ambitious person, only out there to make money, entrepreneur, really wanted to get rich. And a lot of the men that followed him really looked up to him because they loved that about him, that he wanted to be rich, get rich by any means necessary. This was common across this area at this period of time, both for the Americans and the British and the French, apparently. The whaling master, Mr. Brown, starts put, putting everybody to work. All right, we buried them, let's get to work. All the men are like, no, we buried our captain. We, we don't wanna work today. That's something that you don't do the day your captain dies and you're buried. They just wanted to relax, chill. They didn't want to do any work. So now you have a leaky ship and a discontent crew. Not a good combination at this point. August 23rd, they leave Cerro. August 25th, they get to Benito and they pick up over 8,300 seal skins. September 19th, they leave Guadalupe for Hawaii and now the ship is leaking 17 inches a day. Sunday, September 28th, Hawaii is in sight. They get to a certain distance and the Hawaiians come on board and they give them tokens of friendship. I imagine they probably give them lays, tokens of friendship. They anchor in Tawai Bay and they traded with the Hawaiian. I looked up on the map for a Tawai Bay, just in case it was, it still existed. And nothing like that existed. I looked up and down all the islands and was looking for a Tawai Bay, but I guess they don't have a Tawai Bay. October 9th, they leave Tawai Bay and they get to Oahu, which is the day's trip. Then I realized they left the northern island and came down to Oahu. Then I realized he's spelling kawaii with a T. This is the second word that I realized that was spelled with a T that's known to be a K today, right? We, le we learned in the introduction, first word we found was tameamea was spelled with a T, right? We found that in the preface or the introduction. Now this is Tawai, Kawai, right? We're just starting to pick up information and start putting things together. October 10th, they get to Honolulu Bay. The chief in Honolulu tells them that they can't dock because they heard that there was somebody sick on the ship. And so they keep them out at a distance. They can't come all the way to the bay because earlier, I don't know if it was a few months earlier, there was an American ship docked and they had a sick guy on it and got everybody sick. So wherever the chief was in Honolulu, they told the Port au Prince, no, stay out there. We don't want you to come in. Even when the guy died the next day, the chief still didn't allow them to dock. 
October 26th, now the Port au Prince is stocked with hogs, uh, plantains, sweet potatoes, taro, and different fowls, chickens. They leave and they head to Tahiti, and eight Hawaiians jumped on board to help with the leaky ship. So because it's leaking so much, they start throwing things overboard. I think they threw a couple small cannons overboard and anything heavy and bigger so that they don't weigh it down, things that they didn't really need. And so they used these eight Hawaiians to help them do that and to help with the leak. November 18th, they realized they missed Tahiti and so they steer to Tonga. November 27th, they see Ha'apai. Now it's leaking 18 inches an hour. Saturday 29th, 1806, the Port au Prince reaches Lifuka. We're in Tonga now. This is where Captain Cook got to before, where they had that plan to have a celebration and feed everybody, and Captain Cook had the two ships. This is where they had that plan. It was in Lifuka, where they planned to ambush Captain Cook and his crew there, where there were still men on some of the ships, and so the chiefs were divided as to whether or not they were gonna do it. It was in the middle of the day, there's two ships. Half of the chiefs said, no, we can't do it right now because there's still people on the ships. If we do it right now, they're probably gonna get away and go tell their country and then their country is going to come back and kill us all. At the leader, the leader of the time, Final Kala, basically told them, all right, let's have this celebration and send them on their way. The original plan that was originally told to Mariner later on was that all the tables, or the, the polas is what we call them, there were all the clubs and the spears and the weapons were underneath them. And during the celebration with Captain Cook, they were supposed to have a war cry and then everybody was supposed to die that day. I told that story earlier in the introduction. That didn't happen. They disagreed because of the disagreement Agreement. They said, all right, let's just have this celebration and send everybody on their way. Interestingly enough, Captain Cook runs into that same type of plan and ambush in Hawaii, which is interesting. How was it that they had the same plan and they were amb ambushing the same way? So that's another interesting note. So that evening, a few chiefs came on board with the roasted pig and yams for the company, their welcome party. With them came a Hawaiian who spoke English, who jumped on a ship from Hawaii to Manila, and then from Manila to Tonga. And that guy, is Hawaiian guy's name is Tui Tui. It's another Hawaiian name with the T's. Just taking note. So now we have Tamehameha, Tawai, and we have Tui Tui. Hawaiian words known today with a K that are just interesting notes right now. At one point, they started with a T. So this Hawaiian guy, Tui Tui, he convinces the entire crew that the Tongans had good intentions. They were nice people. They were friendly. He spoke English, so he was the only one communicating this to the captain, Mr. Brown. They get off the ship and they go back to shore, leave the food there, and so they're talking amongst themselves, they're eating and whatnot. And the Hawaiians that came on the ship from Oahu, from Honolulu Bay, they start warning the Palangis and telling them, no, these guys have ulterior motives at this point. They're feeding you, but we know these people. We know them. They are dangerous people. We know this behavior. Perhaps they spoke the language and understood the language. Either way, those Hawaiian guys started warning the crew of these guys that brought them the pork and the food and that they had hostile intentions. They advised Mr. Brown to be very careful. <laughs> Mr. Brown ignored it. At this point in and, and time, Mr. Brown, he wasn't a criminal. He wasn't a pirate. He's a whaling guy. He was only out there to get whales. So there's no way that they can have any bad intentions towards him because he's just out there to look for whales, which of course, if he did listen to it, may have saved his life. So the crew was instructed to clean the ship. They were instructed to repair it. The crew told them, no, we're, it's Sunday. We're on Sundays, we're accustomed to getting going on shore. That's what we do. We've always been doing it on Sundays. But Mr. Brown was adamant about them cleaning and repairing the ship. A lot of the natives started to lure them, like friendly, yeah, 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 come, come, my canoe, we go, climb the coconut tree, or whatever they said, right? We go, come, heka. Some of them requested to go to shore. That's what they wanted to do on a Sunday. The captain was like, no, you're, you're not going to go to shore. You're going to do what I say. You're going to clean and we're going to fix. If you think that you're going to go on shore, you're, you, you're going to hell first. <laughs> a guy named James Kelly jumps up with a knife and he threatens anybody who tries to touch him, he's going to stab him, right? So he and two other guys, they go grab their stuff and he, they wave a canoe, hey, yeah, we will we, we'll want to go to shore. And so the canoe comes up and they get into, these three guys get into the canoe and they go to shore. 15 of them 
follow after them. They follow their example and they go to shore. After a while, the rest of the crew follow them and now they're, now they're all on shore. After a while, a lot of the Tongans were on the decks, just in between decks on the ship with clubs and with spears and it was starting to look suspicious. There's a chief named Vatapola. Him and another chief were sitting in the captain's cabin with Mariner, Mr. Brown, and uh, Mr. Dixon. This Vagatapola guy tells Mariner later that they planned to take him that day. They planned that they were going to, a canoe was going to sail close to the ship. Vagatapola was going to yell down at the canoe. They were going to be distracted and they were, then they were going to knock everybody down with their clubs. Mariner is going to the steerage. The steerage is where they leave, they have all the product, all the commodities and everything. And also it's where the cheap ticket passengers are. If you remember the movie Titanic, the steerage is where the poor people work, right? You have the rich people up there and then poor people down in the steerage area, basically cargo. He meets a few guys who are coming towards him and they're warning him like this, there's, there's suspicious stuff, activity going on. There's too many natives on, you know, on the ship now. What are we going to do? We should kick him off. Mr. Brown initially ignores him like, oh no, it's okay. It's cool. He's still cool. Mariner affirms the threat. Mr. Brown takes Bagatapola's hand and leads him up the deck with the other chief, whoever it was. And we'll find out later who it was. Mr. Dixon and Mariner follow. He notices that they look kind of nervous. I don't know if that's true or not, whatever. Mr. Brown, the captain now, he makes mention to them that he doesn't like a lot of people on board to get off the ship and everybody has weapons. There's just too much going on. So Bagatapola has some guys, oh, to put the weapons onto the canoe and send them away. Oh yeah, well, basically tricking them like, oh, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We put the clubs and the spears. And Mr. Brown says, no, you got to get rid of the tomahawks and the, these long spears too. And like, All right, yeah, throw the tomahawks. Now, I've never, it's interesting that he called them tomahawks because that just shows that these guys were always armed and had weapons on them and it looked like a tomahawk. So they get rid of the tomahawks too. So then everybody was sent to shore and then they everybody gets off the ship. That plan for that day doesn't happen. Everybody's off the ship and now they're at shore. The carpenter and the sailmaker, they advise Mr. Brown, hey, look, we got little cannons, let's mount them and let's bring the muskets up so we can keep them off the ship. If they get close, we're gonna shoot into the water or whatever to distract them to tell them not to get on the ship. Mr. Brown, the whaling master, still doesn't get it. He's like, no, okay, okay, whatever. Act like he's gonna take the advice, but he really doesn't and nothing happens. Monday, December 1st, 1806, around 8 a.m. in the morning, they start assembling on the ship until there are about 300 in different parts of the ship. That was at 8 a.m. 9 a.m., the Hawaiian guy, Tui Tui, speaks English. He comes on board and he invites Mr. Brown, hey, let's go to shore. And then Mr. Brown goes ashore with him. Mariner goes into the steerage to fix a pen. There are products in there that was used to fix pens in there. He looks up and he sees Mr. Dixon with a musket and he's trying to prevent any of the Tongans from getting on board. At this moment, he hears a loud shout and they call them Indians. Apparently the term Indian seems like a generic term to a savage, savage brown skinned guy, but he calls them Indians. He says the Indians give a loud shout and now everybody's on board. One of them knocks Mr. Dixon down with the club. Mariner runs into what is called a magazine. It was where the big guns were stored and the big weapons basically were stored. He runs into there and he runs into the Cooper. The Cooper was on his way out. Cooper's a builder of the wooden barrels with the metal rings. That's what a Cooper is. He runs into him in the hallway and they run into the magazine area, the magazine room. They talk about blowing up the ship like Samson of old to sacrifice themselves and kill their enemies. So he goes into another gun room to find flint and steel, something to start a gun something to create an explosion. But he couldn't go in there because the spears were leaned up against the chest that was full of the flint and the stuff that he needed to blow the ship up. It would have made it too noisy if he moved it around. They would have heard it. He goes back to the magazine room and the Cooper's in there scared for his life, right? He doesn't know what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen to them. So Mariner tells him, all right, let's run out there into the heat of battle so that they kill us immediately because Mariner didn't want to be tortured to death. He wanted to meet his fate and meet it quickly. That's what he told the Cooper. So he goes over and he lifts the latch and he sees Vatapola in the cabin with Tui Tui examining Captain Duck's sword. It was in his stuff. And then he jumps out and surprises them, thinking that he was going to die right then and there, quickly. Tui Tui turns around and sees him and Mariner throws his hands up and he yells, Aloha! Aloha. That's a word, a greeting word he obviously learned in Hawaii. And Mariner asks him, are you going to kill me? Because he felt like, I'm ready to die. If, if you're going to kill me, do it now. Dui Dui tells him, no, we have the ship already. But he tells him, who else is down here? And he tells him, just me and Cooper, the Cooper. So he leads them up onto the deck of the ship. One of the chiefs who was the, looks like the leader, 
Mariner said he looked like about 50 years old. He was on the deck and he looked and saw him sitting there and everybody else was standing on the sides and whatnot. He was sitting there with a seaman's coat, a sailor's coat, bloodied, soaked in blood over his shoulder. And on his other shoulder, he had a club, ironwood club on his other shoulder. And he could see that on the club was brain matter and blood. And he was looking at him and he said that his eye and his side of the mouth was twitching. Sea coat with the captain's coat and the club and he's like something like that on another part of the deck he looks over and he sees 22 naked bodies and he said he only recognized like two or three of them because all of their brains were bashed in their heads were bashed in they were all unrecognizable and so one of them takes count of how many there are they come and report it to this twitchy eye twitchy mouth guy and then after they're done with that then they throw all the bodies overboard this chief sits there and he smiles at them and he's looking at them and then after a while he takes mariner's shirt and he sends Mariner to shore, but he leaves the Cooper on board. Mariner is wondering what's going to happen. Is he going to die? How is he going to die? He's thinking maybe he's going to go get killed by somebody who hasn't been fighting all day, who's not tired. So they're in Lifuka. After a while, he's led north to a town called Golo. I looked on the map, it's all still there. He sees Mr. Brown there dead on the beach in Golo naked and bruised on his chest and on his head. So he must have got a bad beating. They were signing to him. Is, is this a good thing? Is this, it's okay? It's okay? Whatever it is. Still kind of stared, still in disbelief. One of them lifted up his club to actually hit him. And the superior guy that was over there, chief that was over there, told him, no, we're not going to kill him. Load him up onto the big sailing canoe. While he was on the canoe, saw an old man on the beach parading up and down the beach with a club, yelling, looking at him, yelling and making loud noises and screams and whatnot. Probably just to end intimidate him and scare him even more. Similarity, Amari Haka, for the same reason, for intimidation. Just saying similarities. We're just picking things apart and just finding similarities, reading between the lines, connecting the dots. Anyway, this is just an old man, so it may not have been, but he was trying to scare him though. A boy gets onto a canoe and points at a fire down the way, on the along the coast, along the beach, and he's saying a bunch of words, and he's the word that Mariner catches is the word mate. Either mate, he was probably pointing mate, le ta, mate, mate, whatever, right? And then he, he catches that word and he says, oh, that word means to kill, or that mean word means die. I've heard that word, I know that word, because I heard it in Hawaii. That's the word they use, death in Hawaii. So I looked up what dying or death or killing means in Hawaiian and it says make or it says ho'omake. You turn that K and a T and you got the Tongan word ho'omate which means your death or to kill, to kill you. That's another word that now we have tamea tawai, tui tui, and now we have mate. All T words that Mariner writes down in history that are K words today. So the question is when? After the divide? During the divide and re-education and re-civilization and uh, the colonization? When did they change the that that letter or those letters to a K and why? That's another interesting note. And if they did, because we know that Hawaii was re-educated. They were told not to learn their culture or their language at some point in time. Did they do it themselves to disguise the language from the Balangis? Or the Balangis do it to change the language? Whatever it is, at this point in time, before civilization, the Hawaiians were using the T's instead of the K's. Because all the Hawaiian words and names at this point in time started with a T. So a half hour later, they get to where this fire is and a few people come to the canoe to bring stuff or to take stuff and they take him onto the beach. He sees James Kelly and the other two guys, the guy with the stiletto, the knife, ready to stab somebody who were, if they were to stop him from getting off of the ship. He sees him and those two guys, the first three, to get off the ship next to the fire. Then he realizes, oh, the boy that was pointing, saying mate or whatever, saying that there's dead people over there near the fire. And they also brought out pigs to roast, to cook. From there, they go to the next island north, which is Foa. They try to strip him of his pants and he's trying to keep them on because he's already burning. He has some burn, he feels the heat and the burn on his back and his neck. And now they're gonna take his pants off. Barefooted, they take his pants off and take it from him. And now he's totally naked and now they're gonna walk him in the burning sun. The guys that were taking him and walking him down the beach, they were touching his skin and feeling it and feeling their own. And they were saying that it looks like scraped pig. You know, after you kill a pig and you scrape all the fur off and everything, and it's all just the white flesh. That's what they were comparing it to. As they're walking him, they're throwing sticks and coconut shells at him and it was hitting him and it cut him in a few places on his head and he started to bleed and whatnot and they were clowning or you know messing with him. A woman walks by and stops them and puts an apron, basically a 
skirt of the sea leaf with her big leaves and wraps it around him to cover him. That right there is quintessential old woman or old lady Tongan personalities because they're right now they're in a time of war. Why would she help him? Wouldn't she? Wouldn't you think that it would be more sense that she would treat him badly? And they just allowed it to happen. They didn't say anything to her. They allowed her to do that. And you can only imagine that she probably felt sorry for him, obviously, because that's how the old lady Tongan mentality is. They feel sad and they feel sorry for treating people badly, which at this point, she's probably thinking either kill him or treat him right. <laughs> that's that's the mentality. Culturally, that's how it is. So they let him put the grass skirt on or whatever the sea leaf uh, apron on and they keep walking. They end up getting to a hut. They walk into this hut and there's guys in there drinking kava in a circle. They're mixing in there. So the guys that took him now are in a mix. So they go and they stand in, they make him stand in a corner they start mixing he's there with his grass green grass apron standing there and one of them tells him hey sit down or you make it make a gesture to sit down because it's disrespectful to stand in the presence of a superior to be standing up a guy runs in and says stuff to the to the guys that were in there drinking kava and then he ends up taking mariner with him while they're walking they run into one of the hawaiians that were on the ship he speaks a little english he basically tells mariner yeah finau sent for you you're gonna go see finau which means the hawaiians speak the language or they understand what's going on it's almost like they just came right in. And that's why I'm saying as far as the connection is deeper than what we think because they showed up and they know what's going on. They think the same, they know what the plans are and they understand what's going on. It's not like they treated them different. The Palangis and the Hawaiians, as soon as the Palangis were killed off the ship, the Hawaiians basically just melded right into society, which means they were probably closer to being part of society in Tonga so naturally that it was normal because he runs into him saying, oh yeah, Finau sent for you, you're gonna go over there. How would he know? He speaks the language? Perhaps, perhaps they all do. So they get to Finau Ulukalala's house. This is the first time Finau Ulukalala was actually stated in the book. They go inside and Finau Ulukalala, all Mariner is wearing is his grass apron. Finau tells him, come in and sit down next to him. A woman on the other side of the house sees him and she walks over there and she proclaims, right? She exclaims a cry of pity. And the words that she used was, Oyao si otta ofa. Like you can hear old women saying something like that. Oyao si ete ofa. Nowadays they use more use the word faka ofa, which is sad and it does still draw empathy or sympathy. Awe si faka ofa, that's sad. That's the word that she used when she saw Mariner in the state that he was in, burnt and bleeding and everything. The reason why Mariner was saved is because Finau was on board the first day and took a liking to Mariner thinking that Mariner was the captain's son or that Mariner was a chief in the country that he's from. That's why they spared his life. And they might have spared his life anyway because it was mostly the older men that they killed automatically. The Tongans are told that if they were to start killing to make sure that they preserve Mariner's life, then Finau puts his nose to Mariner's forehead as a friendly salutation. That's what it is. He put his nose to his forehead like this. Later on in the book, it talks about how they kiss or how they greet. And the greeting is cheek to cheek and they make a sniffing sound like this. That made perfect sense because that's how old ladies kiss these, uh, you know, how that's how when you, or any of the OGs, the Tongans, right? When you say lucky, they get together and put their teeth together and they do this. Finau Lugalala did this onto the forehead. Who else does that? The Maoris, they go forehead to forehead and they do the smelling or sniffing sound. Back then, and we're gonna talk about a little bit about it later, how when the tongue is Greek, that's what it was, cheek to cheek and this sound. So that was, that's an interesting similarity. And then after that, then Finau sent one of the women who was in the house with Mariner out outside to one of the watering holes or a little pond or whatever to wash himself off. So it's obviously rainwater or something clean. He washes himself off and then they come back in and then the women put sandalwood oil all over him. Then he describes how comfortable it feels. It felt soothing, it felt, he felt relief of the pain of the sunburns and everything and it basically rejuvenated him. The sandalwood oil. 
I looked up the sandalwood oil is still used the same way today. It's used in lotions and in potions and in, you know, all kinds of different things to soothe and to calm, whether it's sores or just skin in general. It has a rejuvenating feeling. So he comes back in and then he's sent to the side of the house where there was a mat to lay down. Um, you can only imagine how fatigued he already is mentally, emotionally, physically, because he said as soon as he hit that mat, he was zonk. He was out. He knocked out. He was falling. He fell asleep. During that night, one of the women came in with pork and with yams and woke Mariner up and told him, here, eat. And since Mariner hadn't eaten since the day before, he was starving. So he got up and he started eating and he started eating the yams and he looked at the meat and he thought in his mind that he wasn't sure if that was pig meat or human meat. He thought that these savages were cannibals. <laughs> And so he just ate the yams and he grubbed and ate the yams until he was filled. He wakes up the next day and everybody's heads are shaved. He finds out that it's part of the custom that when a Tu'i Tonga dies or a king of Tonga, Tonga of the bloodline of the gods, everybody shaves their head on the day of the burial. The funeral and the burial was that day. And so he came out and saw everybody and everybody's heads were shaved. In the course of that morning, Fina Urukalala takes Mariner back onto the Port au Prince, he takes him on board. Mariner gets on there and he sees some of his friends there. And so he's relieved, like, oh, they didn't kill everybody. I thought it was just me. But yeah, he sees a lot of his friends and they're able to man the ship and use whatever it is that they can still, there's still enough of them to be able to move the ship where Fina wants them to move it. Fina wanted them to bring the ship closer to shore. So they move it through a narrow passage and they get it as close as two, three hundred feet shore. And then they, they were told to run it aground or basically turn the engines full on and let it go as far as it possibly can to get as close as it can. But as it did, it is now run aground. So it can't go any further because the ship is now in the sand. While they were trying to move it through this passageway, there was 400 men on the ship just up and down there probably and you can only imagine a bunch of Tongans 400 of them up and down on the ship touching stuff looking at stuff and they're making noise and whatever it is that they're doing and it's making it hard for the ship to move Dui Dui goes and tells Finau these guys are interrupted they can't move it as close as you want it to Finau tells them alright everybody sit down and be quiet let these guys do their work the Greenwich Maritime Museum the Marine Archaeological Society finds the shipwreck of the Port Au Prince and where do they find it? off the coast of Flaw. So now we've come to learn of the behavior, the personality of the Port Au Prince, of Captain Duck, what the Port Au Prince did all the way up to this point. And it brings us back to the memory of the curse of the little girl that was part of the nunnery that the Port Au Prince and those burnt down who promised them that William Mariner himself that he wouldn't see his family or his parents and that the ship would never see England. And this is that curse come true. So we've come to the end of chapter two and I hope everybody stays with me as we go through this, I do give a lot of my commentary as far as us reading between the lines and connecting the dots of the history of Tonga before Western civilization. So I hope you stick with me and let's walk through it together. Till next time.